All right, so I, I don't normally um, frequent venues such as these with 3D printing and technology because I study fossils and work in Kenya, in very north of Kenya, at a place called Lake Turkana. And I come from a family, the Leaky family, which has a long tradition of finding fossils to help us understand our origins as humans on this planet. And so, for me, this is much more about what I would normally talk to you about. And to be very honest, this is really where we are now, the age of computing. And um, that technological sort of revolution is, is really tremendously exciting in terms of what we can actually do. And now we can actually, as a species, make an impact on the planet today. Uh, there's no doubt about it that we are making a dramatic impact. So I would really like to give you some background of my work because I think it's important to understand why I've got into the world of, of um, 3D printing and digital models because I think this is, this is where it's all coming from. So the reason we have fossils in, in East Africa is because of the Rift Valley. So we're on the east side of Africa. The Rift Valley is a, a depression where it's running from the Gulf of Aden all the way down into Malawi. You've got a rift that's on the western side. You've got the eastern branch of the rift. Because it's a depression, water's flowing down into it from the margins, the highlands. And these rivers form lakes and have been forming lakes over the past five, six million years. They fill up with sediment and then they disappear again. And it's these open habitats, these lake formations, such as Lake Takana, which is one of these lake basins that is in the very north of Kenya, that are the reason that the fossils are there in the first place. Not only were they good places for animals and human ancestors to live, but those lakes also were the place where these bones of these animals were preserved. And because you're in a rift valley and you've got a lot of tectonic movements, fossils that are buried deep underground are brought back up to the surface again and they're eroded out and that's where we look to find the remains. So just to give you some idea, using the geology, we can actually reconstruct the past, we can go back in time and understand what these lakes and rivers were doing and we can try to piece together the relationship between um, where the fossils are, the age of the deposits. So you go back 4,000 years ago and Takana was almost dried up, it was gone um, due to climatic uh, changes and differences. This is going back 9,000 years, it's the last high stand of the lake. You can see how dynamic it is, you've got 1.9 million years ago, you've got these big rivers flowing down in from the Ethiopian highlands, other rivers coming in from the south. All the time, animals, human ancestors, living, dying, using the landscape. This was what was going on. This is how we can then understand the past. So just to go back, that's three and a half million years ago, you had another very large lake in the basin. And 4.1 million years ago, you can see what it might have looked like then. Today, this is Lake Turkana. And you can see the Oma River flows down from the Ethiopian highlands. The Ethiopia-Kenya border runs across the top end of the lake there. But the fossil deposits, this is 160 miles, 200 kilometers in length. Fossil deposits run up both sides of this, this um, long modern day lake. It's tremendously remote. It takes us three and a half days to get up there by road. So all our supplies and trucks and fuel and food have to go in by road, I actually fly an aeroplane which makes it an awful lot easier to get in and out of this place. But it is truly the world's best laboratory for field work in terms of finding evidence of human origins. So, let's go on here. 1967, my father moved to, to, to run an expedition in Ethiopia and he had access to a little helicopter which he flew over the northern end of uh, Lake Turkana, landed and found fossils and set off on his expeditions right then. And we've continued to work at Lake Turkana every year since then. And as a result, have actually managed to piece together a um, tremendous amount of information about what the past four million years looked like. They set off on these camels, really with very little 
um, equipment. And really then, this is the year that I was born, 1972. You can see my mother holding me here as my father's trying to stick together pieces of this important skull, which is called 1470 Homo rudolfensis. But as a result, many, many publications, scientific publications, have come out of the work in northern Kenya. Lots of these uh, covers of <coughs> nature, which, to be honest, it's such a pres prestigious journal, but to have got nine covers out of work, one basin, a long-term effort, is truly remarkable. And I know there are many scientists in this room who will appreciate the significance of that slide. Needless to say, from knowing literally nothing about our past some 60 years ago, we now have been able to understand much more about how, uh, what our origins actually look like. And you can piece these together from these different skulls to actually understand how those, uh, those relationships might work. Homo, these big brained things from which we came, you can see Homo erectus here um, going, leaving Africa for the first time 1.8 million years ago. You all have an African origin. And actually, as Homo sapiens, you left Africa. We left Africa only 75,000 years ago. And I think that's something that in today's world is often forgotten. And I think more and more so, people aren't stopping to think about our past and our place on the planet. And this is where these fossils and technology, I think, intersect. And we've actually now got a very powerful tool to try to bring this rather confusing picture to life to, to people um, in classrooms in the, the world today. Moving <coughs> on, the Takana Basin Institute is a privately funded institute that we've set up in Kenya, but with an academic home at the University of Stony Brook in Long Island for whom I work. I'm actually based in Kenya, but this institute is essentially an effort, almost like the ICTP, in that you've got field centers where scientists can come, they can use the facilities, their dormitories, their big laboratories such as these. You can actually do your field work, come and go from these stations, interact with scientists. You've got differential GPSs, you've got power, you've got internet, you've got labs for storage. Um, and you've got two of these centres, one on each side of the lake, and they're being used increasingly by foreign scientists and university students within East Africa um, to actually do work, whether it's on archaeology or geology or modern-day fish or the insects. It's a very dynamic and an exciting environment to actually come and be based at. So I wanted to give that um, information to you so hopefully one day we will be able to see some of you actually in East Africa using these facilities. We now have um, labs where you can actually clean specimens. You can see here they're cleaning them with air scribes. The fossils are now also stored at Lake Takana in these two field centers and they complement the collections in Nairobi. Collections belong to the country, they're national collections, they're given national accession numbers. You still have to go through the permissions to explore and to do research through the ministry and the museum. But this is an extension to those um, uh, academic um, or the, the national repositories of the specimens. And then we can run field schools. We run a field school out of both sides of the, the institute, the field centers. And this is an increasingly popular um, field school to attend. It's a full 10-week course and it's given, the lectures, the courses are given by some very prestigious lecturers. We're also able to do an awful lot more now with the communities on the ground in terms of healthcare and everything else. So I just wanted to give you the background for what I do really as, as my, my day job and to introduce you now in terms of how we actually find the fossils um, and how this actually ties into the world of uh, digital models and uh, 3D prints. Finding these fossils is incredibly difficult, right? There still is no other way to find them other than to walk over these areas. And there's some 25,000 square kilometers or more that actually need to be looked in. And so having spent a little bit of time in the technology world, I thought, well, isn't it possible somehow to try to capture high resolution imagery and actually crowdsource that? and get people engaged in the effort in terms of our finding fossils. And so this was 
was that? Thunder! <laughs> In Kenya, I'd be a little bit nervous. <laughs> what else that might have been? <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> So we, in, we engage a um, large team of maybe 10, 15 fossil hunters, all drawn from the local communities at Lake Turkana. And with their incredibly skilled and trained eyes, we send them out looking for fossils. And I guarantee that they miss things, because you'll be walking along, you're talking about a football match or the bomb that went off in Tanzania or whatever else happened, and you miss the things that you should have found. And they're also very difficult to, to identify. So you pick every little thing up and you work out what it actually is. Look at this slide very carefully and you'll actually see there lower jaw of a 4.1 million year old hominid as it was er 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 um, being exposed out of the ground, eroding out of the surface. And then you see it's gone again. So you not only have to have your eye in, but you also have to know what you're finding. Once you find it, you excavate it, you put the sediment into the screens, and you look for tiny fragments. Those will have to be sticked, you know, stuck together. So it is incredibly um, time-consuming. I know a lot of you wouldn't have the patience to do this work. And this is my effort. Why I thought, well, can't we get images? Can't we then capture these in high resolution and crowdsource this? So I had a drone that we put a camera to. This is the octocopter. Mm. And this was some of my early discussions with some of the people I met at the TED conference, Autodesk in particular. And they came out and we were flying this drone. Drones hate wind. And Takano is extremely windy. And so this didn't work particularly well. But I think in a few years, this concept might actually come to something and that we actually might be able to do something with the idea of crowdsourcing fossil hunting. Kites work a lot better, and I've been able to attach my camera, a Nex7 little Sony camera, to the kite and get some images from the air. Um, and so you can do some work with stitching. This is an excavation, but you really do need very high resolution images. And so I got very frustrated with the fact that I couldn't get the, the detail that I needed. You want to be able to find big things like that. Well, there's a bit of a crocodile nose that's coming out of the ground. So big things you can actually see, but those teeth that were in that mandible are too small. And so we need to find a, a balance. So then I was at uh, the TED conference and speaking to people at um, the Autodesk stand, and I've got to know quite a few of them um, very well. And they've been incredibly helpful and I think quite excited about trying to apply some of their, si their, their software and their tools to this, this study, which in, to many people is so significant in terms of who we are um, and that it is something that people need to stop and think about. This is a pig skull. Look at that tusk coming out of the top. These things are as interesting as the dinosaurs are to so many kids, but they've never been given the exposure. They're, people haven't had the opportunity to explore them and get excited about them. That's a crocodile you can see here. Sunglasses on its nose for scale. But there's some amazing fossils that actually come out of these deposits at Lake Turkana. Those are just an artist's reconstruction of some early antelope. And you can see here some of the most significant human ancestral remains, the skulls that have actually come out of the lake basin. Now these are very difficult to find, they're often not as complete as this, but these are the classic skulls that have enabled us to understand our origins over the past four million years. So I was there and I spoke to the, um, the Autodesk lot, this is Sean Hurley, and this one year he had this booth where he had all these cameras around and they were busy taking pictures of people sitting in the middle of this thing and I thought my goodness I know what I could do with that <laughs> and so I thought forget taking pictures of people's faces and modeling I said well how about we apply this to the fossil collections and so they said well why not we'll get involved and get behind your initiative to make digital models of the collections in in Kenya so with photogrammetry as the starting point, we've been able to take a series of images which you could then build up your digital model. And you can see it was a very sort of 
trial and error effort in the beginning because I really didn't understand the st about how the software actually worked and that you really had to keep the specimen still and that you couldn't move the background so we hung some sheets up in the lab and we put tape on them and we propped this up on a um, a little jar and we just started taking pictures of these things. They're propped up on plasticine and all sorts of uh, precarious um, situations. Fossils are very heavy. You can't, you know, just put them on a little table. Some of the, the, the skull um, models are actually taken from casts of replicas because you don't really want to handle original material unless you absolutely have to, which is why scanning is so much better because you can actually do a whole lot more without balancing it so precariously. So here you can see the software 123D Catch, um, which was the initial software that we used to capture um, the, the models. And you can see the position of where all the, the, the photographs were taken as it builds up the digital model. So with these images, we actually then were sending them over to Autodesk and there we developing the software, which I think hasn't actually been released yet, but it's coming out fairly soon, their recap photo um, software with Maya and Geomagic Wrap, Mesh Mixer and Photoshop, a combination of all of these things you can manipulate <coughs> the models and actually build some pretty impressive specimens. And digital models which you can actually look at, rotate and explore um, and I think bring them much more to life than just seeing a two-dimensional image in a page or in a book and you can then start to say well why does that look different to to something else so that was a pig skull this you can see is an early antelope and there must be 26,000 or more specimens in the museum some of them are tiny teeth some of them are big impressive skulls that's just the fossils not even beginning to look at what the archaeological collections are and beyond and many museums are beginning to digitize their their collections because there are no replicas of these specimens they, they just don't exist and so although you may have a cast of some of the more impressive hominid remains they're they just aren't done for all of them and still they get damaged. So again, that's an important specimen that I often use in my talk because I can show the fact that there's no bone at the bottom here and why this has caused so much confusion in terms of its interpretation and the like. So then we thought, well, well let's try and work out how we can actually improve on our photographic, uh, you know, taking, taking photographs of these things because you, you put your skull on your on your table and you have to walk around and take a good 120 pictures and it's incredibly frustrating and time consuming and I, I was thinking well I don't know why Autodesk didn't give me their booth with their 20 something cameras because now I understand why it was um, designed that way so we tried to come up with some ideas where we could build a little trackway and we could attach maybe three cameras on a trackway we went so far and actually 3D printed um, a, a thing that we could actually use a simplified version of this but there are ideas as to how one might speed up the process of, of taking these photographs and then one thing led to another um, Faro rather Faro gave us an arm scanner which you can see here and we are able now to complement the photographic models with actual laser scans and so this is the beginning of the digital archiving um, project that's going on at the museum where you can get much more precise models but you still it's really nice to overlay the texture files with these because then they are so much more um, impressive to look at um, so the combination of having the, the laser files is that you've got really good scaling and you can actually then scientifically they're much more accurate to use but in terms of capturing the the um, collections we're trying to do all of that we've got scanners in here CT scan data with photogrammetry as well this is this is important that the museum retains a lot of this information. It's not only a tool for scientists, but I see it as a tremendous opportunity now in terms of tools for educators. So we've got all these scans, now what do we do with them? I mean, what, how do I get them out to the world? How do I get them into classrooms? And so I wanted to build a virtual lab 
where I could place the most impressive of these collections. And I said to Autodesk, would you help me do this? Because of your 3D CAD software, can you not create me this space that we could virtually walk in like you would in the game Riven, where you could actually move this way and turn that way and pull out a draw? And I had all these great ideas, which it wasn't realistic to do. I think one day one could possibly do it. But I wanted to create this look and feel of these labs where you've got these dusty shelves and drawers and you know, to pull one of those things out, you want to look and see what's inside it. And um, so this was the, the result of our effort, where we actually developed a website called africanfossils.org. Um, and here's a, a, a video play of what you can do within it. You can actually then explore around and look at the three different sections. And I had thought we'd put the hominids in one, we'd put the fauna in another, we'd put the archaeology in another part of this, this space. Um, you've got clickable links where you can actually get into a YouTube um, feed or you can get into Google Maps. And this was done fairly quickly because we wanted it out by um, the Autodesk University where we were planning to launch this. So we didn't give it as much time as, as we could have done. It really was the first run of the website. And there are things about it that are extremely frustrating that you can't link to that one skull and share it with your, your friends. It doesn't work on a, a, a tablet very well. You can't rotate it. You have to use a video file. There's a number of different features that I want to add to this site. And we are rebuilding it at the moment. And we'll be able to release that in the next couple of months. And I'll show you some of the new um, ideas going forward. But the point being that because you've got the models there, you can interact with them. You can rotate them. And, and it's a lot more fun. To, to play with. So um, this actually is a real picture actually taken from the mess at uh, Lake Takana on the west side facility at TBI. And you can look over the, the Turkwell River. You can see here the partners that have been involved in this project today. But many people, visitors, come up to TBI and they say, Where, where's this lab? <laughs> I say, it doesn't exist. It's not a real lab. <laughs> But it looks quite realistic, so we're quite happy with that. But as a result of now those, um, having those files, I was thinking, well, what can we do to make this more accessible? And so, again, Autodesk have the software called 123D Make, where, as you are probably familiar with, you can actually get your 3D file and you can slice it and you can build these little cardboard cutout models where you can glue they've got a number on the bottom so number four six onto number five six and all the rest of it but it makes a, a nice very cheap digital model come to life if you can actually get your hands on a laser cutter and this is is just as useful as having a expensive cast in the classroom in fact, I think it's more useful in that <coughs> the students could be involved in building it and begin to look at why this is different to another one in the collection. And so I would like to be able to make these files downloadable at a very easy click of a button to print out um, or to, to cut out on a certain thickness of cardboard to people who have access to laser cutters. It's one thing, but if you don't, then we need to think about doing this in a different way. So here's a different skull. You can see this is actually cutting out and, and packaging some of these kits for a, a, a classroom. A nice model, but for schools in our part of the world, in Kenya, this is still not good enough. And I keep coming back to the fact that it's about trying to get these models into our classrooms, not to the classrooms that have all the 3D printers and access to, to you know, sophisticated technology. But with this technique, you can still easily do that. You can actually print on a paper, A4 paper, a template that's designed for a certain thickness of card, and you can stick it onto an old cardboard box and you can cut it out and you can actually then build your little model like this, paper mache the thing and paint it. And this is a great project that anyone can do and you can refer back to the website and you can then get people excited and inspired about 
um, you know, our past and our origins. Taking this step further, this was at the 3D print show in London where we all met, um, and there at the very top was this little stand by MCOR, the Iris True Colour 3D printer, and I don't know if some of you have seen this, but I was um, quite excited to see it because with this little printer, which essentially is using the same technique where you're actually building layer up by layer with paper, but as it cuts with the laser, the outer layer, it applies the texture file, the actual paint or the, the image. And so I gave them one of our high resolution images and they were able to build a life size printout using paper and the photograph uh, literally wrapped around it. Um, and you can see the, the texture. It was a, just a, it's a really beautiful print. It obviously is very time consuming, it takes a long time, but this, this is probably a step beyond some of the, the, you know, the, the actual laser, the, the 3D prints that are coming out. But it was nice in the fact that it was done with paper and it had the true colors actually printed to it. So these are some screenshots of where I want to take the website now and you can see here still going to have the information on the side. We'll have an actual Google map which shows where the fossil came from, the text that will come in, video files that we can put in that give you some idea. But to be able to download the file, a low resolution file that you could then print on a little 3D printer, that you could then have your own collection, that you can hyperlink to one image and share it with your friends. Um, to be able to compare two different models and rotate them so that you can actually see what the differences are between them. And I think this is, this is some of the stuff that I think will make a real difference to the site and be able, uh, enable us to promote it and try to drive the site, the downloads and the educational aspect of it. So this is where we're going in the next few months. And of course then the 3D um, prints that we were able to do. Now that print is actually been printed on the object printer which is obviously a higher end printer. You can see this is a smaller skull. I brought the small one. I've got a few of these done but this is heavy to carry from Kenya. So if you could you can look at that but the quality is still it's really nice. It's heavy and what was so striking about holding a 3D printed solid object was that I had never ever before felt the difference in felt the difference in brain size okay and the reason we are who we are is that we've got this big brain homo sapiens has a tremendously large brain compared to some of the things that went extinct in our past so that little skull there is much smaller brain to some of these bigger things and when you hold them together the weight difference was tremendously dramatic um, and so that's some of the things that you, you, know, you wouldn't necessarily get from handling casts or you wouldn't get from looking at images. I was written um, to by, through my website by this father of this little chap called Leo who said he had a school project and he wanted to have some models that he could print. And he has his little printer here. I don't know, you could probably tell me what that is. So I had no idea. You have it. There you go. That's the one. Okay. So he got this little bit of kit and, and I sent him the file and they were hugely excited. And this is their first little calibration print that they did. Apparently it's very, very small. Um, and the, the, you know, I mean, you can see it's a skull and you can see which skull it actually is, which is um, pretty amazing. And this is them printing it on that little printer. And I think they were able to print that skull that you're holding there um, which is 1813 on that weeny little printer and you can see it as it's sort of building up here um, and the, the, they were just hugely excited and they were kept writing to me about this project that they were doing and that they were going to display it in the classrooms and they've given me a really good feedback throughout the whole process as to how it's working and you can see it here must be coming right up that probably is the limit to what that size that printer can print I imagine but you know it's pretty good for a little head that's been uh, printed as part of a school kids project and so he's got several other skulls from me to print and I've told him that um, you know give me the feedback I'll be happy to 
share the experience with him. But it'd be nice to be able to make that possible for other people um, through the website. And I think we're, we're getting to the point where we'll not only give them the lower resolution download for the 3D printer or a half size model, you could give them the, the laser cutting file, you could give them just a PDF and all the rest of it. So that's, that's sort of where we're going. Cosmo, who you, we've heard spoken about, Cosmo went on with his, his um, the horse head. I met him also at the print show and he said, could I have one of your files to play with? And I said, well, sure, but um, what can you do with it? And he produced this beautiful bronze out of one of these skulls and you can see it um, there again, which is a really nice technique. But again, you can make these beautiful pieces that get people talking about what that thing is and why it looks so different. And to me, it really is about getting these, these files out into the world so people can think and understand and, and look back in time. With the digital um, models, we're trying also now to, to see if there's a way where if we could scan individual pieces of artifacts or bones that we might then be able to use software to refit things. And I think this could be a useful tool, not only scientifically, if we can get this to work in terms of the resolution of the, the scanners, um, but also to then those pieces you could 3D print out and people could experience the actual gluing together of a fossil. We don't find complete bones. They're very rarely complete. It's all about piecing this together. And so I think you can do that in a similar way with these objects through 3D printing and building your own little jigsaw puzzle to reconstruct your actual stone tool or, or fossil hippo. The other question is then, what do you do when you've got, very rarely, but it does happen, that you get these very complete finds? Now this is a 1.6 million year old skeleton of Homo erectus that was found on the west side of Turkana and you can see when it was actually found it was found by just a small piece of the skull was eroding out of the surface and when they actually began this excavation more and more of this came out of the ground and it belongs to a 9 to 12 year old boy um, and it's it's been called the Turkana boy or the Nariakotomy boy but it is very unusual to have um, teeth with the limb bones and this is a really important specimen and most complete specimen to come out of the Turkana Basin. But what do you do about scanning that? What do you do about sharing those files? And so this is where I want to bring in the whole issue of, of um, copywriting. Um, that's a revenue stream in terms of the cost of that find. They sell that <coughs> cast, the museum, for $6,000, right? Now, it's being cast and with silicon and then the, the fiberglass um, is then used to, to make your replicas and the painted mold of that cast goes for that amount of money. The museum obviously don't want to let go of the <coughs> revenue stream. Yet there's got to be some balance. There's got to be some way that you can get files like this out into classrooms. And so we've got to sort of work out who has the right to the images? Who has the right to the files? And I think this is a discussion that people don't generally know how to deal with yet. And I'd be really interested to, to learn more about where the thinking is in terms of um, just copyrights and, and how to, to retain the right of the higher resolution files that I think the museum needs to keep a handle on. But you need to be able, and I'll argue this so strongly, you've got to be able to get these cheap files out to people so that they can actually work with the, the files and be inspired. Because otherwise there really is no point. And so um, we, we've, um, the cast of another of these smaller skulls, the museum would sell at $450. And then you've got another site out there called Bone Clones, which offer cheap replicas, but they're not that cheap actually, $250 for the same skull. But what's worse is that these are not like the real thing at all. And these are going around museums and are in, on display because museums don't want to pay 
for the real object, the real cost, so they're buying these replicas which are not like the real thing at all. So this site, I would argue, does a lot more damage in offering a false product than it would be if you could actually give them the downloadable files so that they could actually put the real thing up into the, the museum. We actually got a lot of criticism for a publication, a nature publication, because um, somebody had, or the only file, the only cast they could get hold of was one that came off bone clones. And they told us that we didn't know what we were talking about because they were looking at the cast. He said, well, the find that we have isn't like this thing at all. <laughs> anyway, but really coming back to this day and age and the fact that today there are these seven billion people on planet Earth and that really this is when my, great, my, my grandparents started working at Olduvai Gorge in 1945, there were only 2.3 billion people on the planet. And today we've got up to seven and we're on the increase. These are staggering numbers. And this hustle and bustle and rush through life, who stops to think about how did we get to this as a species? And I think it's so, so significant. It means so much to me that people actually stop and reflect. And you can't do that any better than by using the fossils, the real thing, and to try to get people engaged in this world of prehistory and our past and human origins is contentious because of the whole religious movement. But you don't have to give that debate to a, a young kid. You want them to handle something and to think about the questions and to ask them themselves. And I think this is why it matters to me that we make this possible. So we know the dinosaurs <laughs> went extinct 65 million years ago. And that was this, the fifth mass extinction event on planet Earth. And today we are the cause of, as Homo sapiens and witness to, the sixth mass extinction. Because of our actions, the seven billion people on this planet. And you really need to stop and understand that as one species, we've had this tremendous impact. And it's not good enough to just ignore it. And to understand that, I think the fossils are a really important tool to make people stop and understand our origins and the fact that species do go extinct. And we will go extinct. Homo sapiens, un they're, they're no question. In fact, I think it might be much sooner than many of us are willing to admit. And we will be just one layer in the future Grand Canyons of, of this world. The Grand Canyon has over half of Earth's history in its sediments. It's millions and millions of years tied into the marine sediments that are, that, that are in the Grand Canyon. And we'll be but one layer, and I'm quite sure, if you go back to that, that we're going to be this layer of plastic when it happens. <laughs> 3D printed or not. <laughs> <laughs> the plastic is, this is the plastic revolution, if you want to put it that way. And so that really is where I would like to end, to leave you with that thought, um, and to acknowledge the fact that the team who found all the fossils, the research project, part of my family, um, the National Geographic Society funded us through all these many years, um, and Autodesk, the museums in Kenya and the Institute, Faro who've given us now scanning equipment, Geomagic have given us software to work with. This is a real team effort in terms of now bringing the past to to life and I, I am just very pleased to be able to share this with you and I'd very much like ideas in terms of how we might uh, make it more, more um, the, the outreach to spread further. Thank you. <laughs>
amount of CT scan data. Again, in terms of letting that out to the public, doesn't serve that much purpose. Um, but sure. the, in terms of the science, and again, as part of this digital archive, the museum needs to build up these high-resolution replicas, these files. But you, there's not much point in sending all of that out to the world. It's heavy, but you, you need to put the showcase specimens out there. And that's, again, why I think photogrammetry is so interesting, because it's more realistic as well. So it's a combination of this digital archiving, which includes the CT scan data, the micro CT data, so that people don't have to handle originals all the time. But um, also where I'm coming from is more the broader impact in terms of education and um, trying to make these uh, lower resolution files more accessible. And the second question, uh, do you use uh, any kind of algorithm to, uh, for fragment matching? No, but that's what I really want to do. You see, I had that stone tool image in lots of pieces, which are 2.3 million year old tools that were found in an excavation, mm -hmm. and they could actually piece it all together again, so you can work out exactly how that tool was made. All right? But what fun to stick it together and work it out. All right? And there are hundreds of specimens, and many of them are assembled by these tiny little pieces, and I love to do this. I spend hours sticking things together. I've grown up doing it as a child. There were our jigsaw puzzles as children. And we, you know, just, you just love to do it. And so, but if you could replicate that process now digitally or um, through sort of models that you could make, but on a more scientific level, I would love to be able to get high resolution scans and get the computer to fit these things. I've got boxes of these things that still are unfinished projects and don't have the time to do it. So it's part of them, um, we're trying to actually implement that in a, in a next grant. But you've got to scan the objects first as well. Yes, so you should have high throughput scanner or the fragment in a certain volume of dirt. So maybe you can find also some smaller or micro fragment that you can't really see or you can confuse for just dirt, but yeah. you have to make a facility to scan yeah. every single grain of dust of a volume. And the high throughput facility has to be... Yeah, that's the point. The, the cost is always the... the cost is, uh, so we, we still use our little team, send them out to find the fossils. We don't fly the, the high resolution drones yet. I'd love to make it happen one day. But these are sort of bigger dreams and the intersect between the reality of the science, the practicality in this remote location, and just also trying to use the technology to, to bring it to life to people. So, yeah. Talking about costs, do you think if the museum put the files of these fossils online for free, how they may finance the process? That's the big question. I think, um, I think that you want to, your higher resolution files are probably something that you could actually use, or if you could maybe have it a printable item that, from, say, Shapeways that you could collect revenue that would go back into the system. But you've got to be so careful not to overprice things because, frankly, the costs that are out there for sale are so overpriced that they're not benefiting the science, in my opinion. And I think so that you, you need to, there has to be a balance where the, you know, you, there's more impact, I think, in terms of the open source um, approach where you can get people thinking and working on things. Than, but that's a hard case to push to developing nations, museums who are struggling for cash. But I don't think yet this... I, I just don't think with the, the laser scans that we can actually get the detail. You have to use the CT scan files and really high resolution prints to actually replace the casting. I mean, I may be wrong on this, but th there's nothing there that yet matches the very high quality that you get from a silicon peel on a tooth. I mean, you can see the microware, you can see everything from the silicon peel. So I, I, I think it's not yet to that stage. So the cars still serve some purpose. Exactly, but the resolution for this output is quite good for education and purpose. This was also just taken with photogrammetry. This model hasn't even had a laser scan near it, which is quite impressive, really. So. Um, and I understand that it's hard to push this case of getting out the, the data, but you know, you should consider maybe saving the higher resolution yeah. for uh, 
uh, museums and for sale. Yes. But uh, really sharing this uh, this simpler data with the world would be much more beneficial. That's exactly my point. That's exactly it. A bunch of people working here have had a lot of uh, contact with uh, people from the rest of the world, simply like putting out the work. Oh, yeah. And I, that's exactly where I'm coming from. And that's my point to the, the museums. And I think they, they're very positive because of the educational n role that it plays. But I've got to so sort of gently, it's a, it's a carrot and, and stick approach that's having to, they're getting used to the idea. Um, but in a sense, this, this project's taken on a life of its own. And, uh, you know, that's exactly what I want to do. I want these. I want that kid to be able to get his file and print it out because you know he's got inspired. He's learned so much about where he came from just because he's been doing it. So that's it. All right. Thank you all. <laughs>